Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about chemicals. We're going to discuss the five or six most common used chemicals in the food plotting industry. Uh, everyday food plotters like myself have a few chemicals on the shelf and we're going to discuss those, what they are, what their names are, and how to use them. Now we're going to bring in Brad Harper from Harper Growing Solutions who's an expert on chemicals and liquid uh, fertilizers, liquid limes. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to do a uh, sprayer calibration video because quite honestly, it's 35 degrees up here and that's just too darn cold. So we're going to probably get that in May. But anyway, we just want to talk about chemicals, the, the most common chemicals that, that most food, uh, food plotters would use. Now, I know there's a lot of you out there that are uh, into specialty chemicals, uh, whether it's soybeans or corn or just a lot of specialty chemicals that we're not going to discuss today. Just keep in mind, folks, there's a lot of new people getting into food plots. They've got a lot of questions. And unfortunately, there's so much um, information about chemicals on social media, on YouTube. Some of it's really, uh, really good. Some of it's not so good. We're just going to discuss it today, what people should look for, uh, what, what these chemicals do, and hopefully stir some questions that people want to ask. And then uh, when Brad and I get together in May to do some more videos, we can answer those questions. But uh, so we're going to bring in Brad Harper and talk about chemicals. All right, so Brad's back once again, and we're going to talk about chemicals. And again, these are the basic chemicals most food plotters are going to use throughout their food plotting career. This is the chemicals I have on the shelf here at Northwoods. We use them um, on our food plots. Um, but Brad, so these are the, I have four listed, but there's actually six here. And there's four different um, classifications. We've got uh, an all-purpose glyphosate, uh, a broadleaf. These are very uh, a variety of broadleaf killers, um, and then the grass killer, and then uh, the final one is a pre-emergent. Now, again, there's 50 to 60 vid uh, not videos. There's 50 to 60 chemicals people can use that some need restricted use permit. Uh, some I've never even heard about. So. Uh, just bear with us. This is more of a beginner's video. Uh, folks that are just starting to get into food plotting or just starting to look at is there a chemical that pertains to their situation. We just want to talk about the four or five basic uh, chemicals most food plotters are going to use throughout their careers. So we'll talk about the first one, Brad. This is Roundup is the, 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 the everybody calls it Roundup. Yeah. Glyphosate is the, the that's the active ingredient. That's the that's the chemical name. Roundup is just a company that that uh, many many years ago introduced us to glyphosate. So, this is an all-purpose. You know, most people spray Roundup or gly glyphosate on on a food plot right before they're going to start working the ground up. Uh, there's Roundup Ready beans, Roundup Ready corn, uh, Roundup Ready sugar beets. This is the chemical. Um, is there some points you want to hit on about glyphosate, some things to look out for? Yeah, and, and that's, and like you said, you know, we're kind of going over some of this for the new guys who have the questions, just getting into it. A lot of guys know exactly what we're talking about, but for the new people, this is very informational. I mean, we're looking at with glyphosate, it's the non-selective, so it's going to kill anything and everything that you spray on it. Um, and I think with all of these, before we get too far in depth, that's something that read the label. That's just the easiest way to put everything as far as rates, um, you know, how to mix, all that kind of stuff to read the label. Protective but, gear? Yeah, protective gear, all the PPE. Um, but yeah, glyphosate's basically your non-selective, gonna smoke everything um, pre-plant situation. Sure. Yep, that's, that's your, you know, if you're going in to put a food plot in uh, in two weeks, you might want to come in, whether it's, you know, if you're, if you're going to put in um, brassicas, grains or whatever, it's not, it's not got a lingering in the ground effect. Correct. It's not going to hang in the ground. It's a contact killer. Uh, I like to spray about noon, the hottest part of the day. Uh, you definitely want to spray, what do you think, Brad, a couple hours before, let's say rain's coming. What yeah. kind of time frame are we looking at? Um, with a lot of the post-emergent herbicides, which are the top ones here, I like to have a minimum of six hours. Okay. I mean, it's not worth playing with it. You're getting close just because you can, because at the end of the day, all these cost money. It's not worth playing right. around. So let's a minimum right. of six hours. Okay. Um, we don't want to spray in the morning when the dew is still on it? Correct. Okay. I, and, you know, I like spraying uh, 
uh, kind of later afternoon when the wind calms down. That way I don't have to worry about overspray or drift or anything like that. So, um, you know, anytime afternoon, but for sure be careful because if it's windy out and you spray glyphosate, Whatever it hits, it's going to kill. So if you got some trees on the outside of your food plot, that's mm -hmm. something. That Apple trees, you know, yeah. If you exactly. got yeah, screen guilty, did that once yeah. before. I found out the hard way. <laughs> um, one now, another question is a sticking agent. It's called a surfactant. Okay, and what that does, folks, is it, it you can add this sticking agent to the to the glyphosate, the Roundup mixture, and it actually helps. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to simplify this, yeah. like I was talking to. Um, my, you know, my, my, my son or daughter, it makes this stickier. It sticks to the plant because it works by being absorbed into the plant. What do we add to this? Yeah. So we can add, the best thing to add is an AMS replacement. What that's going to do is that's going to help get your water ready for glyphosate to make it the most efficient as possible. And it's also going to help the plant to take it in more readily. Um, that's the first thing. And then like a surfactant, um, the, in my opinion, the AMS replacement is really all you need. Um, AMS, what does that mean? What is AMS? It's ammonium sulfate. Okay. So ammonium sulfate replacement. Okay. That's about all you need with, with glyphosate. We'll talk about a couple other ones for these other ones here that we can touch on. But for glyphosate, if you have AMS replacement, that's that'll do just fine for you. Okay. Scenario. And again, sorry, we're our, our home state of Michigan. I'm down in... Detroit. I'm driving up I-75 to head up north to my hunting land. I want to stop at uh, the sporting goods store or the tractor supply, buy my 41% glyphosate. They don't have any AMS or anything like that. What do you What do you look for? Okay, just a general store. They've got the Roundup. Yep. They don't have anything else. What can we do? They're going to have some sort of surfactant or right. adjuvant there. And that's something you might have to ask because uh, the names are always different, different brands. Mm -hmm. But if you ask, they will have some sort of surfactant or adjuvant. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have the AMS replacement, anything will be better than nothing. Oh, uh, Dawn dish soap. I've heard of this multiple right. times. Okay. I've tried it once, uh, a, and I've got a 30-gallon sprayer. It was a couple of drops of Dawn dish soap. Now, that's kind of a crutch. It's kind of a Band-Aid, yep. but it does work. I would recommend... Uh, you know, finding a good co-op or a, you know, feed store, seed store. There's, they're all over. And again, we're using the home state of Michigan, but you know, anywhere. Uh, I know out east, uh, it, New England area, they get to be far and few between. Um, the Dawn dish soap, a few drops per acre, per gallon. What are we looking at, Brad? Yeah, and to be honest, I don't quite know that exact mm -hmm. uh, formula. Yeah. Because dealing with the ag side, we always right. got surfactants yeah. everywhere. But I bet you can find it on Google. Yep. So then you're so, checking it out sure. just to figure it out. In a pinch, you can do it. I don't recommend doing it all the time. I've done it once or twice, but I actually go to Tractor Supply. We've got one on here. And I think they have what's called, uh, it's it's a, it's a white jug with a red and black label. I think it's called 8020 Surfactant. That's what we use. Yep. Crop oil, is that another one? Uh, crop oil is one, mm -hmm. um, but that's something that you don't necessarily need with glyphosate. Okay. But if that's something you got, putting a little bit in, that's not going to hurt. Oh, I'm the sorry. 80 20 that you're talking yeah. about, that's called a non ionic surfactant without getting too far in depth. And if you read the clefidim label, that's what they call for is either uh, crop or the clefidim label will call for either crop oil or a NIS, a non ionic surfactant, and that's what that 80 20 is. Okay. And that, that works really well with clefidim. Mm -hmm. That works really well with 24DB. Okay. That's something that. Uh, any ad, adjuvant or surfactant that you can get is going to help with all of these and is well worth having one. But bottom line, to try not to confuse people, we want something that's going to help this stick to the plant. Yep. Okay. All right. So now broadleaf killers. Now what these all do, uh, the, the 2,4-D is the most popular one. So let's say you got some switchgrass, you've got some screen, which is our RHD screen, which is a grass, um, cereal rye, oats, all grass families. And you've got broadleaf, the most common one's going to be pigweed. Um, and you want to kill it, you're going to use this. Okay. Now, where it gets a little confusing, and you got to be careful, uh, folks have broadleaf in their clovers. What are their options? I mean, personally, I like to mow, but sometimes you, get, you, get, uh, you just get a, a, a catch of something you can't seem to get rid of. So can you explain 2,4-D, 
2,4-DB, which is Buterac, yep. and, and then IMOX. Can you talk about the three? And yep. this mostly, these two are going to be when folks want to kill something in their clover, their clover chicory. This is the 2,4-D is what you want to kill uh, in your switchgrass. You want to kill broadleaf in your switchgrass or your food plot screen. Yeah, so the 2,4-D <clears throat> is basically any broadleafs. That's not selective. Any broadleafs that you have, the 2,4-D is going to take that out. Now, the only thing to be careful with the 2,4-D is that's going to cause the residual in the soil. Good point. So therefore, if you want or have to spray that, then we want to try to give it some time in between the spray application and the planting time. Now, if you're planting the screen mm -hmm. and you're going in there, a little bit different. But yeah, if you're planting something with peas, um, clover, mm -hmm. something along that line, brassicas. Buckwheat. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's something that we have to be careful of and give it two, three, four weeks. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Seed's not cheap. Mm -hmm. Fertilizer's not cheap. And we go and plant. Next thing you know, we realize that nothing comes up because there's still some 2,4-D right. in the soil. Just be careful. Give it extra time. But that's something to keep in mind. That's a, that's a, that's a great point. I saw a video a couple months ago. A guy was talking about uh, he's going to do the buckwheat system. He's spraying with Roundup and 2,4-DB. And I'm just going, oh, my God, that's... Terrible advice. So if you're going to do a broadleaf planting, like you said, brassicas, clovers, um, buckwheat, yep. peas, beans, anything that big leafy plant, you cannot spray 2,4-D three, four, five weeks before you want to plant these. This has got a residual effect, hence the R um, that's going to linger in the ground. Correct. So, And then when we talk about uh, like clovers, alfalfas, but you still have broadleaf weeds in those plots, we can spray what's called 2,4-DB. Um, You're looking for this B right yeah, here. This has B, got the B, this does not. And it's uh, Buterac 200, and that's going to kill broadleaf weeds, but not kill clovers or alfalfas. Um, so that's, like you said, if you got pigweed coming in, a lot of the times you might have some Queen Anne's lace, uh, what have you. If mm -hmm. there's a broadleaf in your clover, and mowing's not going to take care of it, and we have to spray it, 2,4-DB, but without getting confusing, if you have a clover chicory plot, pay attention to this one. The 2,4-DB will kill your chicory. So then what happens is we're going to go to the IMOX. So we're kind of going down 2,4-D, all broad leaves, 2,4-DB. We can still spray it in our clovers and alfalfas without killing those. It's probably going to yellow them a little bit, but that's okay. It'll bounce back. But then we'll go to IMOX if we're running chicory in any of those mixes. And then, therefore, that'll take care of broadleafs in there as, um, without harming your chicory. Mm -hmm. Now, again, personally, I like to try to mow my problem out. I'll give it a year. If I can't get that out, I will come in. Me, personally, I'm going to use the IMOX. Okay, I this stuff scares me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I use the IMOX personally. Yep, absolutely. And so then, that's just something that <clears throat> take a look at what you got, and then you can decide which one of those that uh, is going to fit best. Mm-hmm. All right, so clethodim. Now, what this is is a specific grass killer. Now, this is opposite of 2,4-D. So where we use clethodim is if you get a grass problem in your clover, your clover chicory, or your, if you've got brassica. Now, a lot of times we'll use oats as a, um, as a, in part of our summer soil builder. If those oats happen to go to seed, we plant their brassica and all of a sudden we get a flush of oats. You can go in there with clethodim. It doesn't hurt the brassica. It kills a grass. It will kill oats, rye, Johnson grass, um, the screen. You can't spray clethodim on the screen, yeah. switch grass, anything that's in the grass family, this will kill. So if you've got broad leaves growing, now you want to spray the grass again. I like to mow, but some some of that some of that quack grass and clovers you just can't get rid of. So I will use clethodim as a grass specific killer. Yeah, and that's something that on the label there's a wide range of rates and everything, so you can look at that label to decide where you need to be at for what grasses you have. A lot of times, uh, you know, you can take a picture, look on Google. They have some apps that will actually tell you, you know, what grass that is, and then you can revert to that label. It'll give you different rates for different grasses, and then therefore you can go forward with that without messing. It'd be well worth it. But a lot of the times, quack grass is very hard to kill with clethodim, so kind of reading that label again, that'll tell you the best time to do that. 
um, just checking that out. But yeah, overall in the clover, if you're spraying clethodim, you're going to wipe out your grass issue when you can't take care of them. Both. Right. My favorite time, and again, I very seldom do I resort to this, but what I like to do for spring, let's say we have our clover blend, our clover blend plus chick, we, we got some grass that I just can't get rid of. I like to mow it, like to let it come, the grass start to come back about for 10 days and then I spray it. You don't want to mow it and then spray it right away because you want that grass to come out of shock a few days and then start growing. And then, like I said, you get into the heat of the day um, and that's when I like to spray. Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> the last one we want to talk about is Simazine. Now, Simazine is a pre-emergent. It's not going to kill anything that's growing. This is a pre-emergent that we use on our, uh, our switchgrass plantings. And we've done some uh, on our HD screen, uh, but Brad, you've got some interesting research. We're kind of rethinking that. We've actually backed the rate down that we recommend on our HD screen after talking with Brad and his research. So, uh, Simazine, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so again, <laughs> stressing, read your labels. There's charts in the Simazine label that goes over um, how much to have or add per your soil sample. So you can look at organic matter, your CEC number. There's a chart right on there. That way, no matter where you're at, you can look at your soil sample, look at the label, you'll be able to figure out what you need. And that's probably one of the, the things that we had talked about that <coughs> Excuse me. is going to really improve not only the effectiveness and make sure we're not putting out way too much or way too little, but just trying to make sure we're not smoking anything. Because mm -hmm. if you put down a lot of pre-emergent you could have issues. So that's why we keep stressing, read that label, check that chart out and make sure we're adding just the right amount. Yeah, now most of these, the, the, your soil sample, your soil type won't affect these, but because this is a pre-emergent, if you've got sandy soil, a low CEC number, yep. you've got thinner soils, you wanna back this down to almost a quart an acre, okay? And if you've got a little bit heavier soils, you're looking at a quart and a half, maybe two, depending on what you're spraying. Simazine on um, switchgrass, um, we talked about this, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Roger. No more than two quarts an acre, especially if it's heavy ground, if it's a little bit lighter ground, the sandy areas, if we're going to plant the RC Tecumseh, you're looking at maybe a quart to a quart and a half an acre. Correct. Right. Absolutely. And that's like... Uh... I would say the same for the screen, mm -hmm. you know, the HD screen, mm -hmm. backing that rate down one quart, maybe a quart and a half, mm -hmm. again, looking at your soil sample to determine that. But sure. that one quart to quart and a half rate is going to give you really good protection and, and help you to get that out of the ground, eliminate that competition for a little bit. So, right, so right. Just that, yep. that lower rate, we don't have to worry near as much about doing any damage to anything that we're trying yeah. to grow. With, with talking with Roger after, uh, you know, we, we looked at your research on Simazine, which, which is quite interesting. Uh, I've never really talked to anybody that's, that's done this kind of in-depth research on Simazine. Um, he was talking, he, he actually uh, came up with some uh, instruction on, on, uh, on Simazine and switchgrass, and he said anything over two quarts per acre, three, four, there's a potential of injuring and damaging that young switchgrass. Now... Folks, I know a lot of you don't get on Facebook, but if you are on Facebook, there's a phenomenal page. It's called Switchgrass for Habitat. A lot of this information on Simazine and pertaining to switchgrass can be found there. Roger Sampson uh, from REAP Canada started that page. A lot of great information. But yeah, so the, the thing with Simazine, there's been a lot of numbers thrown around, um, but we're kind of erring on the side of caution. That's what our rate's been all along with switchgrass kind of the one and a half to two quarts an acre and we're going to apply that same thing we've changed the instructions now with our hd food plot screen recently if you bought screen earlier in the year january february we've got an updated uh information just get a hold of us but um yeah we you know one of the things also that i talk about a lot if you're going to spray anything especially uh like the screen uh switchgrass you know, you can recover if you screw up a food plot, you can recover fairly quickly. The screen and, and the switchgrass, it's tough. I highly recommend a test area first. Uh, you know, obviously Roundup, we're not spraying any, we're not spraying Roundup on anything that's growing that we want, unless it's beans or corn. But if we're going to spray 2,4-D on the switchgrass or the screen, do a small test area first. You know, you know th let's say this is your screen. Just do this little spot right here. 
Um, same thing with this IMOX or the 24DB. Take just just do a small area, give it a week or two, see what it does, and just make sure. You know, I've seen some scenarios where somebody got a leftover jug from somebody's cousin, somebody's brother gave it to them. Yeah, that's 24D. Well, no, it's not. It's Roundup. Yeah. You know, so that 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 happens. That's that's part of life. But I, I again, if you're spraying something, uh, do a small test area uh, if you can. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and uh, again, kind of going back, we've been talking about doing that calibration video. We'll put that together here uh, shortly when we can. Mm -hmm. But that's huge for all of these to know exactly how much rate of the uh, chemical to add. That'll all be in the label. But we still need to know how much area we're covering in order to make sure that that lines up. So mm -hmm. I, I keep pushing that. That's very important, especially when we're looking at like a cinnazine as a pre-emergent because if you're not calibrated pretty close, what we could end up doing is, you know, possibly going 1.5 times the amount that we were kind of shooting for. Sure. And that's just well worth, take the time, we'll get calibrated. We'll get that video out here soon. Mm -hmm. But that's just something to keep in mind as we're looking at these rates. We need to know how much we're covering. Yep. Big thing, follow directions, read the labels, follow directions. Um, there's a lot of information on social media, on YouTube. Some is accurate, some not so much, but the best thing to do can, to keep yourself safe, read the labels, call the company. You know, we can, we can offer some help, um, but the bottom line is, you, you know, your, your sprayer's got to be calibrated, you know, and, and that, that's a big thing. Yeah. Your soil type, if it's a pre-emergent. So the best thing is, is read your labels. Correct. And that's what I think, too. A lot of the times that I get questions on herbicides, I tell guys, don't listen to me. I, there's no need. Everything's in the label. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, oh, he said this, he said that. No, don't worry about it. It's in that label. Read that. And then that way, that's straight from the people making it. And that's the best way to go about it. Sure. Sure. So uh, basically, this was just to get people to understand what the basic chemicals are. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. You can ask them in the comments below. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get together in a few weeks. We're going to do that calibration video and we can get into more depth on each one of these with the questions you folks have. So again, comments below or ask northwoods at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, folks, and we'll see you in a few days.